Grace and peace to all of you, and thank you for your interest. Thank you for joining our class today. We are uh, starting a new topic, and also we are starting with a new class name. So uh, the topic is going to be uh, the Atonement of Christ, and the name is going to be the Geneva class. So uh, as always, uh, one thing doesn't change, <laughs> certainly hope that what you're about to hear is truth. We're going to be uh, dealing with uh, scripture now. We dealt with history before. We're turning to uh, the word of God uh, today. I hope that is going to be accurate. I hope you are blessed, and uh, I hope that God receives the glory for the teaching of his word. So let us join uh, our first session of the Geneva class, our official uh, class name. And before we get into the actual study of uh, the text, uh, a brief review. Now, we've looked at this when in our, during our history a study in reference to John Calvin, but uh, let's just refresh our thinking on this. This is a, a sculpture on the old city wall of Geneva that says Geneva City of Refuge. And that is there to commemorate the fact that Protestants who were persecuted in other European countries could come and find safety in Geneva. Not only safety, but teaching, because they could study with Calvin at the academy, now the University of Geneva, and then return to take their uh, teaching, the Reformed Gospel of Grace, back to various places. This is the church in Geneva where John Calvin preached, his Saint Pierre or Saint Peter's. Uh, Inside the church, one can find the chair on which uh, Calvin sat, as well as the a pulpit from which he preached. And then I walked uh, one time into the chapel uh, off the uh, sanctuary. And on the wall, one could still read, although it's uh, faded and peeling off uh, now, but the paint uh, with these words, post tenebrous lux, after darkness light, that is the monument, uh, rather the uh, motto of the Protestant Reformation. And this is uh, another picture showing the uh, steeple uh, at, at the church. And then of course, close by, also on the city wall, the Reformation wall or Reformation monument, uh, commemorating various Reformation leaders, but uh, central on it, the four, people who were instrumental in the Reformation in the city of Geneva, beginning with Guillaume Farrell, the first pastor, reform pastor there. Uh, he was succeeded by John Calvin, who was the second. Then uh, Calvin was succeeded by Theodore Bass, and uh, then John Knox, who came there having fled persecution from Mary, Queen of Scots, and stayed for a while studying with Calvin and also preaching. He preached at this building, this church, now designated as the Auditoire, and he preached every morning at six o'clock. Then when he left and went back to Scotland, he took the Reformed Gospel there. But of course, many other pastors, theologians, and teachers studied at the Academy in Geneva and returned with the Gospel to their own lands. So we come now to our study of the Atonement. It is based on eight essays by respected Reformed scholars, and you see them here, J.I. Packer, John R. DeWitt, James Montgomery Boyce, John R. Gerstner, R.C. Sproul, Sinclair Ferguson, and Alistair Begg. Now, the first study, will be the necessity of the atonement. And we're going to be looking at some writings by J.I. Packer, of course, well known. Uh, many people are familiar with his book, uh, Knowing God, also with his famous uh, introduction to the uh, book by John Owen, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. Now, as we proceed through this and other essays, um, the material, that most of the material that you see will be by the person who wrote the essay. However, I have um, taken the liberty to add in some points that I felt were important and uh, some of the comments that uh, will be made will be my, my comments. I'll try to distinguish between the two, but I hope it's 
really teaching the same message all the way through. Now, first of all, Packer says there are contemporary objections and misunderstandings to the atonement, and I can verify that. One of the questions that arises today, uh, questioning the very uh, importance of the atonement, someone says, wasn't the atonement a matter of cosmic child abuse? And uh, in other words, if God really loved his son, why did he put him to death in such a horrible manner? Secondly, why would God kill his perfect son to save hate-filled rebels from the faith that they deserved? Thirdly, doesn't the atonement make God too personal, too violent, too sovereign? Now, let me stop at this point and just go back and answer these questions. I think you probably would perceive the answer quite on your own because uh, it certainly wasn't a matter of cosmic child abuse. That's ridiculous. Um, and secondly, why would God kill his perfect son to have hate -filled, save hate-filled rebels? Well, if, that is a good question because he didn't have to do that. Why would he? Now, the answer to that question lies only in the mind of God, in the heart of God, in the mercy of God. Uh, and the third question, does it make God too personal, violent, and sovereign? Well, you can't make God too personal. There have been those who have tried to make him impersonal. During the Enlightenment, God's imminence was completely removed, and that's the doctrine of deism that we have. God is personal, and God is sovereign. We can't make him too sovereign. Uh, the problem is people making him less sovereign, and I think that's the gist of this particular question, that uh, they want to make him less sovereign, less personal. And what about violent? Well, the death on the cross was violent, and it was terrible, no doubt about that. But does the atonement make God too violent? And I think we'll see the answer as we proceed through Packer's essay. Now, the last two questions are the ones that Packer raises and proposes to address in this particular writing. First of all, was the atonement even necessary? And if it was, why was it so costly? And so he'll be addressing those two. We'll consider those two as we proceed through the class today. But he begins with the dilemma of the law, and that's the right place to begin. Luther says, before you can preach the gospel, you have to teach the law. Law must come before gospel. If you take, teach the gospel without teaching the law, people don't understand why the gospel is necessary at all. And neither do they understand the glory of it. So the law must be taught. And thus, Packer begins by quoting Paul's statement from Romans 7.22, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Of course, the whole context of Romans 7 deals with Paul's personal struggle uh, with the law and himself. And uh, people have rightly commented, I think, that we cannot really understand Romans 8 unless we understand Romans 7. And in one sense, we can never really get out of Romans 7 because we don't get away from this struggle that goes on with, with sin, which is what Paul is talking about here. But we have the glorious Romans 8 that follows. And uh, I am reminded that today, uh, Stevens Valley Church will begin a series of sermons on Romans 8, and I'm looking forward to that. But Romans 7, uh, Paul says, I'm wretched because I see this, this law of sin dwelling in my members. But yet, he says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being. So there's a kind of a division within him. In his members, he sees this other law that wages war against the law of his mind that delights in the law of God and takes him captive to the law of sin. Now, that is a dilemma that every Christian experiences and really that we continue to experience throughout life. And so, as we look at uh, this text, Paul asks the question, what should we say about the law? Is the law sin? And he answers his own question. No, the law is not sin. It's, it's good. It's just. It's righteous. It's holy. The law is not sin. That's not the problem. 
And these are the words of Packer. He says, but my reach after perfect obedience to the law exceeds my grasp. In other words, he says, as I try to keep the law perfectly, I realize I can't. My reach uh, simply exceeds my ability to grasp it, which is what Paul is saying. I want to obey the law, but I can't do it. My own sinfulness prevents me from doing that. And Packer will say, my aim at holiness falls short, thus the dilemma. You see the thing about law. The, it, the law, as Paul said, is holy and just and good and righteous. It is the only way that we can know what God expects of us, that we can know the will of God, that we can know the difference between right and wrong. And, and Paul says, I wouldn't know sin apart from the law. So the law is important, even though the law comes and it slays me. The, the problem is the law demands perfect obedience. I've heard people say, do the best you can, and God will take care of the rest. He'll give you grace to take care of the rest of it. That is not what the Bible teaches. Scripture teaches perfect obedience. James said, if a man keeps the whole law, and yet he offends in one point, he becomes guilty of it all. You cannot add to or take from the law. And uh, Jesus taught the same thing about the law. It is a consistent teaching that the law demands perfect obedience. And if you fail, you are a law breaker. And all the good that you did and the obedience that you did counts nothing because of the failure that you have to keep the law. And also the law does not have any remedial powers. The law cannot forgive. The law can only condemn, yet the law is necessary. It's holy, just, righteous. And so look at this next point, uh, which Packer is making. Paul's failure implies nothing sinful about the law. He's not talking about the law being sinful. He's talking about his own inability to keep it perfectly due to the sin within him. And we never completely uh, can d disavow and uh, and rid ourselves of sin in this life. And this is true of every other Christian. And Packer makes this statement, we weren't righteous before we became Christians, and we are still not as Christians. And I realize when I say that, and I'm sure Packer does also, that there are those who claim sinless perfection, that they claim they have reached a point that they no longer sin. They're just beyond it. That simply is not true. But, Packer points out, the law doesn't get the last word. The gospel does. And that's where we come to Romans 8. That's the beauty and wonder of Romans 8. We can understand it after we've been through the struggles of Romans 7. Romans 8 begins with assurance, with these words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So Romans 8 begins with the assurance there is now no condemnation for those in Christ, but ends with assurance, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present, things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord begins with there is now no condemnation, ends with there is no separation ever. Now, before leaving this particular slide and moving on, uh, I want to comment about assurance because I came from a tradition that believed that we don't have assurance because we can, in fact, if we are true Christians, we can still lose our salvation. I remember a student saying one time, I can walk away from Christ. Uh, I made that same statement one time uh, to an aunt and uncle of mine, and I gave him the same answer they gave us, uh, gave to me. I said, do it. Just walk away from Christ. And he said, I can't do that. Well, of course not. And uh, I recall also um, preaching on this and being criticized. I was criticized one time by uh, a person who, who was uh, superior to me in his position in, in, in the university where I taught. And uh, he made the statement, you know, you can't say that you, your salvation is secure because Paul names everything possible in Romans 8, at the end of the, of the chapter, uh, 
uh, he names uh, these death and life and angels and rulers and so forth and so forth. And the one thing he doesn't name, my uh, superior said, is oneself. In other words, yes, like the student said, like I once said, I can separate myself from Christ. And then I thought about that and it hit me. Paul does deal with me in that and with you. He says, nor anything else in all creation. I am a creature. I am a part of creation. There's not anything else in all creation. If I'm a part of creation, then I am included. I cannot separate myself. That's how strong the love of God in Christ Jesus is for us. Now, what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, being in Christ, Packer says, means we are united to him. We come to him and we embrace him. And I recall hearing a recording of a sermon by John Gerstner in which he said it means being indissolubly joined to him. And Packer points out that behind it lies the precious doctrine of election by God's eternal choice. As we move on down through Romans 8, uh, toward the end, in between the beginning, beautiful beginning, and the beautiful ending, there's a beautiful middle as well. In Romans 8, 28 through 30, we have the golden chain. And in this, Paul links together the decrees of God. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Please notice that all of these verbs are in the past tense, even glorified, which simply means that from God's perspective, as one person said, I think it was a student, it's a done deal. God sees it as a fait accompli, uh, something that's already done. Now, with that in mind, Paul proceeds in verse 31 to ask some questions. They are rhetorical questions, but they are questions that simply emphasize and point up and confirm what he has stated, and that is assurance. What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Look at those questions. Now, there are some propositions, says Packer. There are propositions that can be inferred from the hope that flows from justification. Recall the golden chain again. God foreknew, God predestined, God called, God justified, God glorified. So if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, obviously no one. How will he not give us all things? Now, hold on to that particular second point for a moment, because that's where Packer wants to go to develop his thoughts. But obviously the answer is, of course, he'll give us all things. Three, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Well, no one, because God chose us. Who is he to condemn? Oh, well, no one, because God justified us. Who, what shall then separate us from Christ? And the answer is none, no one, nothing. And this final point, uh, is very well stated, I believe, and this comes from Packer. He says, God has pronounced an eschatological verdict. The judgment is brought forward in time and pronounced now. This is an important point. We understand what the Bible says about the judgment. It is appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And Paul says, all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. And we view that as coming at the end of time. After time, there's the judgment in eternity, and then a dis uh, dividing of people into heaven and hell. But the point is, with Christians, that verdict that ordinarily is at the end of time, that's what eschatological means, at the end of time, is brought forward in time, is brought forward to our time, to our experience, and God's verdict, his, his official court verdict, as, as the supreme judge of the universe, that judgment is brought forward at the point 
that I put my trust in Christ and is pronounced now. That is a significance of justification. And that is why a justified person will be glorified, is in the sight of God already glorified. Now, Packer wants to make a closer look at Proposition 2. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And here's the point of it. Look carefully. Proposition 2 argues, as God has already done the greatest thing imaginable to benefit us, we can be completely assured that everything of lesser benefit will be given to us. The greatest thing is the gift of his son. That has been done. I recall talking with a colleague of mine uh, from the same background as I came from, but I was so impressed by what he said. I was pointing out how God had given his son for us, and he made the statement, and I know he has a son, I know he's a very fine man. Uh, he made the statement, if I gave the life of my son for someone else, if I had done that, then I would do anything for that person for whom my son died. That's exactly the viewpoint God has. He has given the most, the greatest thing imaginable. So of course, he's going to give everything else. Look at this point, lesser benefits cost the father less than our justification cost him. Our justification cost him everything. So whatever else is less, and of course he'll give it to us. And we must get clear, says Packer, that this assurance, this salvation, this glory, which is now ours in foretaste, one day will be ours in fullness. It will be. We're assured of it, and all comes through the cross of Christ. Everything rests on the atonement. There is no other way for God to do it. And if you ask why, the answer is, you know, the only way that God can be God and God can be holy and God can be just is for God to give this great sacrifice, the sacrifice of his son. Now, God cannot be other than God. He would cease to be God. And God's nature is revealed as holy. That over and over and over again, as Isaiah saw in his vision, the angel saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And he is just. Scripture reveals that he is just, that he will not, as you see in this next point, he will not clear the guilty. And it's three times in the Old Testament. And his nature is immutable. His nature cannot change, will not change. Scripture affirms that God is not changing. That's his nature. It stays the same. If he did change, he would not be God. And so it was St. Anselm who really defined why the atonement is absolutely necessary. In his famous book, Cur Deus Homo, which is why did God become man? And that is God is just. Justice demands satisfaction. And the only satisfaction that possibly could be offered for the sins of people is the death of Christ. Christ's death is a satisfaction of the justice of God. But of course, involved is God's love, God's wisdom, and God's righteousness, which all meet together at the cross. And that is why this song is of so great importance, I think to me, it expresses so very well the significance and the importance of the atonement. Now, this is something I am adding, it's not in, in, in Packer's essay, but I, I really felt it was appropriate. John Newton's great hymn, let us love and sing and wonder. Let us praise the Savior's name. Watch this. He has hushed the loud, law's loud thunder. He has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. Remember Paul's statement about the law. The law makes demands upon us, which we cannot meet in and of ourselves. And so the law is issuing its loud thunder, condemning us for our sin. But the love of God through Christ has hushed the law's loud thunder, the cross, in other words. And he has quenched Mount Sinai's flame. Mount Sinai was all aflame, says the scripture, when the law was delivered. And that, that fire becomes symbolic of the law. But Christ has quenched it. How? 
He has washed us with his blood. He has brought us nigh to God. And this stands there, I think there are five of them in all, but this stands to me as the epitome of that hymn, Let Us Wonder. Grace and justice join and point to mercy's store. Grace is a, an attribute of God, but justice is an attribute of God. Both of them are attributes and none of them will be compromised or discarded because they're part of God's nature. But grace allows us salvation. Justice demands punishment for our sins, but grace and justice join, said Newton. They join and they point to mercy's store, that is the riches of God's mercy, which is exactly what Paul says in Ephesians 2. It is because of his great mercy that he saved us. So as grace and justice join and point to mercy's store, when through grace in Christ our trust is, watch this, justice smiles and asks no more. Justice is satisfied, as St. Anselm said. Four. Here's the reason. He who washed us with his blood has secured our way to God. So there is no other way. Paul is clear. God did not spare his own son. Now, for people who think that it is unnecessary, or when people think it is simply a display of love, as Peter Abelard said, and many modern scholars believe, the question that Packer raises is how could it be a gesture, a wonderful display of love if it was needless, if there was another way? I remember not uh, too long ago, shortly before I uh, retired, uh, teaching a class and having a student say in class, I do not believe in a God who would require a bloody sacrifice of his son. My reaction is I was quite shocked. I, I simply said, well, you know, I allow people to say, students can say anything they want in my class. I don't censure them. I don't forbid them from expressing their opinions and thoughts. Uh, but I will say right now, I totally and completely disagree with you. But that was his belief. We, God would not require a bloody sacrifice. It, it should be just a wonderful display of love. But the point is redemption could not have been accomplished at any lesser cost. What my student friend did not understand is it could not be done in any other way than by the, this terrible bloody sacrifice that he's talking about. That's the only way that the justice of God could be satisfied. Why? Because our sin is serious and because God is holy. So it is, has to be in order to affirm the necessity of the atonement is basic to the glory of the atonement. But then someone will say, why can't God just forgive and forget? You know, that's the Muslim doctrine. They say that, uh, yes, when you sin, God just wipes it out of his memory bank, so to speak. But God has a moral nature, and therefore he must judge. And to say that he just forgets about it, compromises, in fact, uh, negates the moral nature of God. Because at issue here, is the holiness of God as well as the justice of God. Now, in terms of what's going on today, uh, Packer says the mistake in liberal theology is that man is capable of judging what God says and reconstructing it in view of man's wisdom. And we see that continually. People look at a passage and say, well, now God doesn't really mean that. And here's what he really means. That is a mistake, yes. Because apart from light from God's law, we are in the dark concerning spiritual realities. When we start relying upon our own wisdom, then how are we ever going to know what the truth is about spiritual reality? Another mistake that people make is to trivialize the word sin, to use the word sin in a social meaning, secularizing a theological word. And I've done it. I think probably you have too. Uh, I had an extra piece of cake and I sinned by doing that. And I, I'm, I'm making a joke out of it. Uh, people see uh, use sin as, as being as something that is uh, socially unacceptable. They don't see the seriousness of it. Sin refers to a wrong relationship with God. And when I or anybody makes a trivial statement 
we are surely don't understand that we are suggesting I'm in, not in the right relationship with God. Now, it's, in part, it is possible for a Christian to sin and walk away from God, not permanently, but to fall into serious and heinous sin. And at that time, his relationship is not right. But the point is, God is the reference point for defining sin. And God's view of sin, given in the Bible, is the view we must adopt. It is a wrong relationship with God. People under the control of sin, and here Packer uses sin and he personifies it, they need to realize this, sin is the firm resolve to play God and to fight the real God and keep him at bay. Note that. And he further comments, if they, those under sin, appeal to God at all, they ask God to act according to their own will and for their convenience, like a servant who gets them out of trouble and bestows on them good gifts. In other words, their view is that God is just my errand boy uh, to do what I want uh, at my uh, beck and call. Sin wills the fundamental abolition of God. Sin says that God should not be there. Sin plays God, fights God, and wishes that God didn't exist at all. And if you think those are strong terms, we just stop and think and analyze this situation. Because I believe it's true that deep in one's heart, when they are under the control of sin, that is the attitude that is operating in their hearts. Now, in the Bible, sin is presented to us not as a, a social faux pas, but sin is presented to us as uncleanness. And I, I look at that passage in Romans 7 when Paul is talking about sin, and he says the law is there uh, to let us see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Worst thing he could say about sin is that it's sinful. And God is just and is going to judge the world. Now, the background of the good news about the gospel is the bad news about the sinfulness of sin and the certainty of sin's judgment. That is why Martin Luther says we must first teach the law before we can teach the gospel. People would not see the need of the gospel nor understand the gospel unless they first understood the law and understood the principle of the law that law must be kept perfectly and that the law has no power to forgive. So the bad news must come before the good news. Why did Paul spend three and a half chapters, as we divide chapters, of his letter to the Romans discussing the sinfulness of sin? First chapter of Romans, the entire Gentile world is guilty of sin. Second chapter of the book of Romans, the entire Jewish world is guilty of sin. And then in chapter three, uh, from verse one up to verse 17, the whole world, there is no one who is holy. There's no one just. There's no one who loves God. Not, no, not one. Everyone is under the condemnation of sin. And so the first question was, is it necessary? Sure that the answer is it is. And the second question that Packer addresses is, why is the atonement so costly? Now for that, let's move down to verse 24 of Romans chapter 3, after he's introduced the idea of an justification apart from law that is revealed. And he says, we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, Packer is going to focus on the word propitiation, and we will also see a further study of that in, in one of the subsequent lectures. But before we come to that, let's just look at this for a moment. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. And then notice this, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he'd passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time. So he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Note two times he makes the 
the statement, it was to show God's righteousness. Now, that word righteousness in Greek, diakosene, is the same, uh, has the same translation, can have the same translation as, as justice or justification. And so we could translate that, and some of the versions do. We could translate this, it was to show God's justice. It was to show his justice at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And you see over and over again, Paul is repeating this point that God is just. And in order for man to stand righteous in the sight of God, to be acceptable in the sight of God, there must be a satisfaction of his justice. And that is Christ. Now, with that in mind, let's pursue what Packer is talking about when he speaks of propitiation as the wrath absorber. He says, God didn't have to choose to save anyone or to love sinners after they lapsed into sin. Well, of course not. What would make God have to? Uh, he could rightly and justly condemn everybody to hell. Of course, there's that aspect of mercy. And remember that Newton said mercy and justice join, but he still could have justly withheld his mercy because mercy is not an obligatory matter, but he didn't. And he chose to save. And Paul says, as an act of propitiation, which is sometimes translated a sacrifice of atonement. So the blood of Christ was a propitiation, a sacrifice of atonement. And Packer says that word in the Greek is best expressed as a wrath absorber that quenches the judicial wrath of God. Well, I thought of a sponge when he used that expression, a sponge to soak up uh, water, mop up something that we spilled. And, and so uh, the blood of Christ is a, a sponge, a wrath absorber that mops up and soaks up the wrath of God. And uh, I'm reminded in this statement by Packer, quenches the judicial wrath of God of what, of what Newton said. He has, uh, has silenced the law's loud thunder. He absorbed the wrath that the law demands for sin. He's hushed the law's loud thunder, and he has uh, quenched Mount Sinai's flame. That's the idea. He's wrath absorbed, or he soaked it up, and now the law is silent. Sinai is silent because justice smiles and asks no more. God must do justice. God must judge sin, period. Now, by the way, we're saved by grace. Prior to the writing of the New Testament in the pagan period, grace meant gracefulness of conduct. It meant socially acceptable behavior. It didn't have the idea that uh, the New Testament presents. And so often we, we define it today, and I think correctly, as using a, an acronym here, God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E. But the late Jerry Bridges used this expression. I've heard him give it on numerous occasions. Grace he defined as God's undeserved favor in Christ to sinners who actually deserve his wrath. God's undeserved favor in Christ to sinners who actually deserve his wrath. But as we've seen over and over again, what God did, he did to demonstrate his justice. And Packer really clamps down on that, just as Paul really did at the, in that passage in Romans 3. He says the New Testament definition of justification is a just justification, a justified justification, a justifiable justification in every way you look at it. And there, again, is no other way than this way, and it was a severe way. Why? Well, the essence of hell is God forsakenness. When God's wrath is poured out in full upon a guilty sinner, then the effect is he is forsaken by God. And that is exactly what our Lord experienced. He tasted hell. He tasted God forsakenness when he said in Psalm 22, what he said from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So what happens in the atonement? 
Packer says, God dis displays his righteousness by judging sin as sin deserves. But the judgment is diverted from the guilty, that's you and me, and put on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, the sinless son of God, acting as wrath absorber. The atonement had to be costly because it was necessary in light of the nature of God, which must inflict retributive just punishment on sin. And so he said, Jesus being our representative makes him our substitute. So he suffered and we go free as Isaiah 53 predicts, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. While we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at that passage and then consider, was the atonement necessary and was it necessary that it be so violent and so drastic? And I think you see the answer is yes. And so Packer says, Romans 8.32 means that he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, has given perfect certainty and absolute assurance that every good thing will be given to us as well. Next week, we're going to turn to an essay by John R. DeWitt, The Nature of the Atonement, namely Reconciliation. Thank you for being a part of our study today. And again, I, I do hope that it has been profitable for you. And uh, I do hope you have a blessed week ahead of you, uh, that uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you today and always.